This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. Hello and thank you for joining us. My name is Chris Jameson. In this hour, we're exploring our theme of 20 years of pure joy, the first nine years. We'll try and give you a real sense of where, why and how Australia's first gay and lesbian radio station came into being and what those first years were like for those involved. Please join the global conversation by emailing onair at joy.org.au. That's O-N-A-I-R at joy.org.au. Or join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag JoyWAD. Joy 94.9 is a gay and lesbian volunteer-based community radio station committed to providing a voice for the diverse lesbian and gay communities, enabling freedom of expression, the breaking down of isolation and the celebration of our culture, achievements and pride. Our guests over the next hour are some of those considered to be the founding fathers of Joy 94.9. They include Joy's first president, member number one, life member since 1996, Mr John Oliver, Joy's first treasurer, member number 12 and life member, Mr Philip Burt, member number 337, former technical director and vice president, Ian McGowan, a member since 1994, member 372, life member since 2001, Mr John Jennings, a member since 1994, former president and program director, Mr John Houlihan, and a member since 1997, uh, sorry, no, that's the one, so that's the five of them. <laughs> See, I knew the nerves would get to me eventually. First up, joining us now in the studio, uh, Mr John Oliver, Mr Philip Burt, and Mr. John Jennings, welcome to this very special broadcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you guys, particularly uh, you, John Oliver, mm. as our first president, as member number one, are credited with being the original inspiration for Joy and what it has become today. I, I want to explore where that inspiration and what the motivations were for Deciding that um, Melbourne could create, people in Melbourne could um, make possible a community radio station directly for the gay and lesbian community. Well, I first started on the travelling down the road to uh, community radio quite a long while before I started Joy. I was involved with a couple of community radio stations around Victoria. And I decided in 92 that we really needed to have a voice for the gay and lesbian community at large because I was at the Midsummer Carnival and I felt we didn't get enough out, enough information out about what we were doing. And those days we were down in St Kilda uh, with the Midsummer Carnival. And I uh, thought to myself, well, the best way, I know community radio, why don't we start a community radio station? I spoke, spoke to uh, two friends of mine, uh, uh, Ian and uh, Rob, uh, Robert at the time, and I said, what do you think about the idea? And they said, well, you're the only one who can do it. You, you know all about it. So, and Ian had a little bit of experience in community radio too. So I decided, well, why not? So I started looking into it, getting in touch with the uh, Australian Broadcasting Authority at the time and uh, found out that we had to have all the paperwork, all the paperwork in by uh, January uh, 93. And I thought to myself, oh, this is going to be fun because we left it right near as usual, the joy policy, leave it at the last minute. <laughs> and anyway, we got we got there and uh, we got it all filled in on uh, Summer Carnival Day, uh, Midsummer Carnival Day, uh, 93. And uh, we worked hard. I started getting people involved uh, through the newspapers uh, and we have s early meetings of people uh, sitting around in a friend's uh, uh, lounge room and discussing what was the best way to do it. And uh, we actually got a lot done and a lot together. And we the application came through that we actually got the licence to broadcast. Of course, the fun was that we were in Commercial Road looking at the idea of broadcasting in Commercial Road. 
But um, they said no at the last minute as we went to set up the studios. <laughs> so we had to change. So um, uh, the, our friends of, uh, of uh, Joy at that time all sort of said, well, what are we going to do? And I said, well, the only way to do it is look for somewhere new. So, and so um, just to go back to the original idea for deciding that we could do community radio, mm. uh, were you aware, because of your experience in community radio and your involvement already, that there was an opportunity from the Australian um, Broadcasting Association that test licences were becoming available? Did yes, you know I did. That then? Yes, I did know that. Um, they were there was sort of a, being around and involved with community radio, like I was. Um, there was a, quite a bit of talk about it, and I decided that you know we we're going to have to do something if we're going to do make the jump and go with it. So we did, and um, it was sort of uh, quite exciting over the and uh, quite a, a stressful time. That's what all I would say. <laughs> so as you said, uh, we uh, we managed to submit the license application mm-hmm. in January 1993. Mm-hmm. You completed it uh, on Midsummer Carnival Day, which mm-hmm. is most people in Melbourne would know comes in the second week, generally mm-hmm. of January. That's right. Uh, the, the centre of Melbourne summer, hopefully. Mm. Yeah, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what then, how long before uh, we knew that w- the licence was accepted? Uh, I think it was around about uh, three weeks before uh, World Days Day 1993. So right through until around November. Yeah. Wow. Wasn't so, confirmed. And you had no idea whether anything was going to happen or not? Yes, or? yes. It was all very tight-lipped and I'm, I'm ringing them and saying... You know, we've got a lot to do. We've got to get uh, a, a hire a transmitter. We've got to hire a desk. We have to get all this equipment together to, to broadcast. We'll have an answer as soon as we can for you. <laughs> right. Typical government. Yes. <laughs> um, what, were the, what were the original or initial terms of a test broadcaster? Well, we only had uh, three days. Uh, originally, it was seven, year, seven days a year. Seven days a year. A year, yeah. Seven days a year, and you could pick whatever days you wanted. You could do it in one lot, or you could share it around and whatever. Uh, the opportunity changed uh, around about two months after we actually started broadcasting, that they gave us 90 days, I think, if I remember rightly, John and Philip. And uh, they gave us, we got the 90 days uh, of broadcasting, and then... We, they had a special broadcast license you could have, like for Midsummer or any other f- th- uh, interesting Event. things happening. A bit like ex- um, applying for an extension to your liquor license. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> for a better way of putting it. Yeah, 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 yeah. We, yeah. And and th- what they did, they gave us the extra days for Midsummer. I think it was ten, wasn't it, John? Something like that. Um, yeah, I think. Or we, two weeks. No, two we got weeks. two weeks. Two, two weeks, weeks. Two weeks. Two yeah. weeks for Midsummer, and then we went for uh, other different. Areas of, uh, I think we went for Easter at one stage, didn't we? We did, yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, any opportunity, <laughs> any opportunity, the pen and paper come out, and we go in for it and see if we could get it, and we got it right each time. So, uh, it, leading up to our full time broadcast, right up until uh, where we got that license in two thousand and two, where we essentially locked into ninety days a year plus special broadcast yes, permissions. Yes, yes, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, what? Uh, what did you have to do or what did you do in anticipation that that original test broadcast would be granted? Uh, things like um, I noticed uh, when looking through the historical documents that you were very quick off the mark in ensuring that Joy was an incorporated organisation, yes. for example. Yep. What, what things like that did you put in place in anticipation? Well, we had to put them in place before we did anything. We ha- Even with the application, we had to get that paperwork with the application for the original licence. So we didn't hadn't really formed fully the committee of management at that stage. And, of course, once we did it, we got... I told the Australian Broadcasting Authority that we were, we were organising that, and we did it and got it all organised, and uh, Philip came on board as treasurer, and uh, quite a few of the others, wasn't it, Philip? Yeah, we had quite a turnover of um, <laughs> committee of management in the early days, but that was because there was so much to be, to be done in such a short time. Yeah, and, and people had to work. That was the other issue. Um, mm. uh, there was a lot of people, well, not, not 
being disparaged just to people who were on the Committee of Management, but it was definitely an active role. You couldn't just sit there and do nothing. Um, we had to get this implement <laughs> working, basically. And over a period of time, um, thankfully, we got it together. And uh, here it is today. Mm, absolutely. Uh, what were the specific preparations that then had to be madly put in place from that point in November when uh, you uh, found out that we had been granted our test seven-day licence? Mm -hmm. And obviously, you had a huge desire to go to air on December 1 yep. as World AIDS Day yep. in 1993. What, what was the mad scramble? What did you pull together? Finding a building where to put it. Uh, a temporary building because we w couldn't go for a full-time rental situation. So we found, eventually found one in South Melbourne and that was in Coventry Street above the warehouse. And we set up the station there. We had a studio built. Uh, we had a, a desk of sorts, for a better way of putting it. Uh, a broadcast desk. As, yeah. no, built for us. Okay. But it came in pieces on the night of uh, of Friday night, uh, going to air on December one. I, plus, I, I, plus, the transmitter was located on top of the building. Yeah, as oh well. yeah, the transmitter yeah. was on the roof. For yeah. the broadcast desk, I, I have pictures in my head of something like a um, a teenager's um, dinky yeah, toy sci science <laughs> kit. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, <laughs> it was scary. It was very scary, <laughs> but and lots of hums and buzzes, and uh, we we eventually got there about six thirty, seven o'clock. Uh, the the Friday morning. But the interesting part, we had the transmitter to be picked up from a warehouse. I said, I'll go and get it. Went out to get it. Wasn't there. We had the antenna put on the roof. We had everything set up. No transmitter. I thought, oh, this is lovely. This is six o'clock in the evening of the Friday. Of November 30. Uh, uh, yep. Yep. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the Thursday. Yeah. And I went and uh, actually... Uh, Eventually chased it around and we found it and I had to go to Port Melbourne, I think, and go to a warehouse and we got it, brought it back, connected it all up. That was fine. Then they walked in with this desk half finished and that sort of like finished me nearly. <laughs> so we eventually made it. Eventually went to where with lots of humming and grinding noises. So we, we've, we've talked about uh, a lot of the te technical aspects and I want to cover off some of the uh, more human reasons why we want to create a gay and lesbian radio station in Melbourne and in Australia. If you want to join in the global conversation, you can email us on air at joy.org.au. That's O-N-A-I-R at joy.org.au. Or you can join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag joywad. Uh, what were some of the human reasons what what was the emotional drive behind putting a, uh, a gay and lesbian radio station together well i had lost several friends to hiv aids and i decided that um i also wanted to do a program at a com particular community station and i had a lot of trouble getting to do the program on air so was it a, a gay specific In 92, program? Yeah, yeah yes and I thought, well, this is ridiculous. I can't get anyone to agree. The pr committee of management wouldn't allow it. And anyway, I pressured and pressured them, and they said yes at the last minute they would do it. And that was in 92. And I decided, well, I suppose that was the final straw. I felt that we needed to have a voice for all of us so we can get on air and talk about our things, the things that are about gay and lesbian the gay and lesbian community, and I think that's important. And uh, I don't think we've ever stopped since we've started. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, Philip, you're one of the first people to join John on the and uh, one of the very early members, member number 12. Uh, you were part of the original committee of management and you were treasurer of the first um, at when the organisation... <laughs> <laughs> treasurer of what, Phil? <laughs> Yeah. What, when, when, when did John approach you with this idea? No, what happened was the very first item of publicity for Joy that I believe was in Brother Sister, about a three-line ad way back in about February 1993. So Brother Sister was yeah. a, our gay and lesbian um, one of, newspaper. Yeah. Newspaper, one of. Yep. And it was only about three lines 
two lines at the back of the, the classifieds, anyone interested in starting a gay radio station? And I had plenty of time at the time, and I thought, yeah, what a good idea. I rang John, and there we go. Fantastic. Um, were, what was your motivation for taking on the role of treasurer of a new organisation? Uh, in real life, or other life, I was an accountant, so I had no trouble getting the role of treasurer because... Nobody bean, else wanted bean it. Bean counters are not uh, <laughs> highly sought after <laughs> as voluntary positions. But in any case, I still enjoyed it. I'd like to point out too, Joy was always in the black, even before we went on air. We've always had funds. We've never run out of money Fantastic. to this day. And that was a lot harder back then for a radio station that wasn't on air yet. It, it, is, a, it is a big achievement. So there were enough funds raised before we went to air um, and you did your sums correctly in terms of knowing what it was going to cost to get to that yeah. first stage. And I must say, the community were fantastic. Uh, we relied on memberships to a huge extent. Back then, it was only $30 for a full-time membership. And people coughed up the money pretty easily for something that they didn't know would happen. You know why? Because everyone agreed it would be a great idea to have a gay and lesbian station. Fantastic. John, what was your first memory of, of hearing about Joy, John Jennings? Um, John Oliver approached me at, at the time I had a, a business um, cafe and he approached me about uh, doing some advertising, which of course I agreed to do. And um, we sat down and we had a long conversation and um, John wheedled out of me that I'd worked in broadcasting for a number of years in both television and radio. So... Slowly but surely, he kept asking me to do bits and pieces for Joy, and then I got hooked, and I became the program director. I was um, training, um, I was president, uh, a number of uh, major roles in the organisation. And uh, as Phil said, we always remained in the black, but we, at, on occasions, we ran very tight to the point where uh, members of the committee of management had to kick money in to keep it keep it going and I remember we we uh, had a, a mail out at one stage that needed to go out because we had the what was it called pride of joy mm. that we um, guaranteed would be sent to all members and we'd had it printed but we couldn't afford to send it so <laughs> and also a very very generous member of the community gave us a temporary loan of a large amount of money that paid for That's our correct, transmitter yes. and yeah. No, panel yeah well actually the transmitter was paid by also we got the loan for yep. that. They bought, bought that outright for us. And uh, a very good, kind member uh, gave us um, a fair $8,000, basically, yeah. put it, uh, to buy the th old 3XY desk and have it fitted uh, because we really needed a proper desk. <laughs> <laughs> and, and look, that, that in itself is a legendary story. The mm. fact that we, one of uh, Melbourne's institutions of rock and pop music right. at the time in commercial radio had a desk which was already from my understanding 30 years old correct yep yep and we took it on mm -hmm. um how the how did we expect it to continue working and how did we keep it working right up until 2008 if That's i right. recall well we had a great technical team and um i mean we talk about the desk as being 30 years old but these desks are still in use right around the world and um it was well looked after, but of course the major problem is things would go wrong with it when you're on air. Mm. And so sometimes we'd be sitting there in front of the microphone and there'd be text f crawling around <laughs> underneath. <laughs> that happened many times with me. <laughs> yeah, fixing bits and pieces on the panel um, to make it um, workable. And I, I, I used to find that... Um, Sometimes things just didn't go right at all. You know, you press a cart machine and... Well, uh, <laughs> John's classic line was he'd talk to the cart machines because in those days everything was fired from um, a, a cart in terms of uh, our sponsorships. And if things go wrong, you'd hear John sometimes on air <laughs> talking to the cart machine because he'd forget to switch the microphone <laughs> off. So we had this joke about John talking to the cart machines on a regular basis. But, I mean, we progressed. Um, we, we then went sort of... Twi we, when we first started, we had volunteers that were willing to um, go to air 24-7, uh, if need be. But, of course, then it, people didn't like doing the overnight stuff, so we no. had to become automated. And, um, yeah, it, it, look, it's amazing the way it grew, and it grew very, very quickly indeed. Um, we've, we've had some 
very, very funny moments over the years. The fact that the transmitter sits on top of Melbourne Central right now is because of myself and um, Ian McGowan, who you'll be talking to later. Um, and the reason that it's up there is because we allowed the transmitter to be um, l uh, borrowed, loaned to one of the other aspirant stations as their transmitter went down just before their broadcast period. Anyway, we were talking about it at a board of manage management meeting and John Oliver starts thumping the table and saying, no, they're not borrowing our transmitter. How dare you do this and how dare you do that? And I said, John, there is a reason behind this. And he said, I don't care what reason it is. I I'll never forget the argument. And <laughs> thankfully, Ian and I won <laughs> because we then realised by moving our transmitter from Coventry Street to Melbourne Central, we had a much, much better coverage. And that was, that was the real reason that we loaned our transmitter at that point in time. But he just wouldn't <laughs> listen to us. I gave in in the, in the in end. In the end, of course. <laughs> but it then, was a well negotiated. And when, oh, very well negotiated. And when it was time to put it up there, everyone was humming and harring. Oh, yes. And I just said, put it up there. Yeah. And we added up there virtually the next day, didn't we? we? we well, once mm. we'd heard how well it worked for oh, the, it worked fantastic. the aspirant, mm. other aspirants, um, we decided we had to get it there ourselves. So that's, right. that's exactly what we did. John, in the last couple of minutes, and in fact, all of you would be able to speak to your experiences here. I know that John Oliver has always been very adamant that we are a gay and lesbian radio station. Mm. Tell us about um, what you needed to do originally to try and get the engagement of women, specifically lesbians in our community. Well, we were told by several uh, ladies, lesbians, that we were a boys club. And, that, and I n never, ever looked at it that way. Never. The very first two voices that went to air was myself and Jan. And I wanted to see male and female to be on air as much as we could get possibly have it. And I've never looked at the idea that was a, a boys club. I always looked at it as being gay and lesbian. And anyone who wanted to be involved, even straight, uh, they could actually get involved and be involved with joy. Now, you know, there was never any idea or any suggestion that we should actually just go for one, but the boys seemed to act up better, got involved, didn't they, oh, John? Yeah, they became, um, I guess, the force behind the station, really, yeah. in the early days. They mm. were the ones that volunteered. And mm. it was a question of us going to air and having the, the people power to do so. So, obviously, it was, uh, unfortunately at the time, there was a lot of guys involved. And we, we had at least 20, uh, 20, 10, 20 women involved at the beginning, and they did all different programs on Joy. And, of course, um, some of the programs uh, uh, John could possibly... Women on Waves. Uh, yeah, Women yeah. on Waves. Uh, and, uh, and there was many, many programs there. And, I mean, it all just took time and effort by actually getting the women involved. And... Um, of course, a GLBTI now, and of course, it's a lot different. But um, everyone's welcome. Everyone's welcome, and they're it's, all it's loved. A, it's always been a family, though, hasn't it? Really? It's always really? been a family yeah, situation. Yeah, yeah. In the and early days, uh, mm. everyone was everyone's best friend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What uh, What were some of the initial programs that went to air? Oh. <laughs> um, well, well, hello hospital. Hello hospital, which is pertinent to today that yep. was designed to reach the guys in the hospitals and if I may tell an anecdote Chris yeah on the night that Joy went to air uh, after a lot of mucking around and John was in, John Oliver was in the studio and the wrong song went to air Jimmy Barnes didn't mm -hmm. matter celebration by Kylie went to air instead I was manning the phones that night and a man from Fairfield Hospital called in and he must have been up late. This is about 1 a.m. And he called up and he said, I'm so glad to have lived long enough to hear a gay radio station. He told me that he only had about a week to live and it brought tears to all of our eyes. An amazing story. Uh, I need to thank uh, Philip Burt. I need to thank John Jennings. Uh, John Oliver is going to stay with us uh, in through the hour. We are exploring our first nine years in 20 years of pure joy we'd love to join our global conversation through hashtag joy wad on twitter email us on air at joy.org.au your comments are next on joy 
This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. I'm Chris Jameson and we are exploring our theme of 20 years of pure joy, the first nine years. In the studio with us now, uh, John Oliver continuing with us uh, and at my other special guests, Ian McGowan and John Houlihan. Good Welcome morning. Back Good to the morning. studios, boys. It's nice to be back. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, uh, following on from our initial discussions, we have had a couple of messages in through to us. I uh, had a message in from Tex, a uh, well-known presenter, volunteer, uh, someone who's been associated with the uh, station for a long, long time. Uh, thank you, Joy. A wonderful World AIDS Day worldwide broadcast and world class too. And happy 20th birthday, much fond, fond love and respect from Tex. Thank you. Thank you, Tex. And also this one from Breed, who is a former president here of Joy, former volunteer, um, a partner of a former pr uh, presenter, so long-time association with the station as well. Uh, Breed says, congratulations to John Oliver. Did you realise what you'd started? <laughs> Monster. <laughs> <laughs> a monster. No, not now any longer. It's, it's great. It's really, I'm very, very proud of everybody who's been involved over the 20 years. Um, uh, Ian, you were um, more involved in the technical aspects of the station as it moved through its first nine yes. years. When did you uh, first become involved? Not exactly uh, sure of the date, but I think it would have been around uh, towards the end of 1993, beginning of 94. So the station at that stage uh, had started uh, broadcasting. It had the, uh, the console, I think uh, yep. you talked about that a little earlier. Uh, it had the console at that stage and not a lot else. Uh, it was uh, a bit of sticky tape, a lot of wire and, and so on. So it was uh, rudimentary would be a good way of putting it. Uh what uh, what amazing skills did you have <laughs> in hand that uh, that you, um, people thought that you'd be able to help us? <laughs> um, can I say none? Uh, <laughs> no, that, uh, look, I, I just had a background in electronics and in computing. Uh, computing, of course, wasn't relevant at the time, uh, but electronics certainly was. And so uh, I came on board uh, thanks to somebody else who was a joy. He, sort of said, we need somebody who's got uh, technical abilities and so on, and uh, literally cajoled me to come along for some time. And I did, and uh, I thought, yeah, this, this is like home to me because I had uh, participated in commercial broadcasting um, some time before that. So uh, to come back in at, uh, at a grassroots level, so to speak, uh, was, was uh, a little bit tantalizing. And so I became part of the furniture there for a while. Quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that's uh, one of the attractions of volunteering for an organisation like Joy, that it's almost a, 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 it, it, it is a personal challenge and that's actually part of the motivation for becoming a volunteer? Oh, look, absolutely. Um, I think it's that, that little bit of freedom that you get because you're able to express your own ideas and, and the way things perhaps should occur. Um, you're able to participate and see the rewards for that. And at the end of the day, you're not answering to a boss or somebody like that. So... Uh, uh, as a volunteer, that's the sort of benefit and reward you get. And of course, there's the end product, the the actual achievement as a whole or as a team um, of producing uh, radio, and that's that's what it was about. Now, uh, John Houlihan, mm -hmm. when would, when did your involvement start I think with about Joy? Ninety four, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I think yep. about ninety four. Yeah, we're all getting a bit old, so it's hard to remember. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long way away. No, I was um, a friend of mine was doing breakfast on a Sunday morning. And he said to me, I need, I'm need. i working on my own in the studio. Will you come in and, and help me with the CDs or records or whatever at the time? And I came in and, of course, I'm very shy. And he said to me, well, look, I'll open the mic and do you, you, we'll have a little conversation. And from that it grew and we became BJ and the Feral Cat. BJ and the Feral Cat. Yeah, we, we used to do all sorts of crazy things like play Walt Disney music and all sorts of silly things. But it was great fun. And that's how I started. So it was a real fun Sunday morning oh, program, basically. Joy was hilarious. We didn't we, John? We had some amazing times. I remember when I was working with Tony, we'd um, we'd be waiting to go in, and the previous uh, presenters would be on air, and we'd be at the glass window poking faces and laughing and carrying on, and they'd be in fits of laughter, we'd be in fits of laughter, and that's how it was. It was a it was a nice, tight little group. We were very friendly, and it was great fun. 
when we when we talk about producing <laughs> programs that are great fun, um, and I, I, I know this from personal experience being with Joy now, but I, I'd like to know how you felt about how that fitted into what Joy's purpose was in terms of reaching the gay and lesbian community. Well, I think one of the things we must remember above all that the gay and lesbian community are just ordinary people like everybody else. We're no different. We just sleep with different people, that's all. And if you've got people out there who are coming out and feeling terribly confused, the best way through anything is not serious, it's making it, it's having fun. And you get people involved with fun, and then you can talk about the serious things. But not don't sort of be too heavy, if you know what I mean, and, and just make it fun. And I think that worked because a lot of young people would get involved because of that and come in and um, they knew that they, they could come into the studio, they wouldn't be pressured, we'd have a bit of a laugh, but we'd talk serious. Ian, do you have a, a, a thought on that as well? Um, I do. I think it, it's one of those situations where, um, and it's probably worth remembering that at the time we were talking about a, um, a period where we would only be broadcasting for two days a week and perhaps over four weekends in a month and, and that's it, we'd be off air again. Um, and so that, in a sense, um, meant that we, we couldn't get the reach that we needed. Uh, we did have people coming on board who would like to present programs, but remember that at the time that we didn't have a lot of infrastructure, we didn't have a lot of technology, we didn't have a lot of many things really. Um, our library of music and so on was limited. Um, and so to, to try and get people um, not only to become involved, but to um, express themselves by creating a radio program of some form uh, was difficult. So uh, in some ways, uh, in contrast to today, where you're very organized, you've got a lot of programming that, that occurs, a lot of planning that occurs, we didn't really have that. It was uh, in some ways a, a grab what you can get time. Um, and so there was the good programs, and there were some pretty shonky ones as well, but uh, you know. Are you suggesting together. that John's program? No, oh, John's <laughs> mine, mine was shocking. Don't get me into trouble here. But no, um, no. Look, John. John uh, had one of, shall we call the the famous programs, if you like. Um, but uh, yeah, there were some some programs which were a little bit rough and ready. But that was the nature of the beast. Um, one of the other things that would occur is that even though people did get involved, um, and in some cases produced programs, the limited reach would become a problem uh, for some people in that they wouldn't get that feedback from talking to their friends or perhaps people in the public or whoever to say, oh, did you hear my program last week? People would say, what program? No, What's I Joy? In, I live so in Collingwood. On. And so that, that made or added to the difficulties of the time. Um, and, of course, fortunately, we all reached beyond that and uh, became what we are today. John. Yeah, and another thing, Ian, as you remember, we had a lot of, we wanted to be seen and we wanted to be about in, in, in all the different venues and different things that we had going, like Midsummer. The first Midsummer broadcast, we were just on a telephone line, but we were there and we did a broadcast for the whole day there and we have done it ever since then. Pride March, we had the music all recorded and played, put through the uh, speakers down at Pride. And, of course, the big big outside broadcast was Diversity in 97. Mm -hmm. We were down there for a week broadcasting. Ian set up a whole studio for us to broadcast from. And we were there for the whole week, and that was in Commercial Road. That was in Commercial. Was that in a shop front? Yes, 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 yes. it is. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure what the shop is today, but it was, at least last time I saw it, um, a salon, uh, which is on that front uh, part of Commercial Road where the Paran Market is. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's still there as a salon, but I uh, could be mistaken. But that's where we set up the studio from. And uh, when you, when I at least look back on that, um, and I think some people have the same view, it was an outstanding achievement really for, for a community broadcaster. Um, certainly our peers in the industry, um, uh, uh, they they knew what we were doing and uh, we did receive some commentary from them saying that you know we were doing an outstanding job uh, most community stations were lucky to even do some form of outside broadcast but to actually have a studio set up for an entire week with satellite outside broadcasts going back to that studio that was um, complex but uh, an achievement nonetheless and it worked and worked very very well 
So outreach and becoming visible to the Melbourne community generally was was key. It was key key thing. We wanted to be able to be seen and be heard at the same time, but also we'd be at like these big functions and be there and be counted for what we are all about. And that seemed to help a lot in confirming that we're here and we're here to stay and we're going to support uh, all of you out there. And that's how it came about. We A lot of ways of doing things, we tried absolutely everything, didn't we, Ian and John? Yes. There was a lot of skullduggery and, and not thievery as such, but a lot of um, <laughs> co- yes. coerced um, borrowing of equipment and so on because uh, we had limited funds. Uh, again, this goes back to this thing about you know only broadcasting two days a week. That meant limited funds. We couldn't get a lot of the sort of equipment that we would dream of. Um, so we had to, to beg, borrow and steal at times. Uh, but it worked. I mean, we, we put it all together with a bit of sticky tape and whatever else we could find. Uh, and the outcome uh, was, was good. good. And of course, we broadcast from Burke Street years and years ago from a bus. From Did a we bus. Were here then? From no, a bus. From a bus, yes. And we broadcast all over Australia through the, uh, B, you know, the uh, CBAA uh, group. And uh, we actually had a special uh, area that we talked about the gay and lesbian community. And that was great too. So we always was trying to be seen and heard out there. And that, as I said, is the most important thing that we actually worked on. I think that Midsummer Caravan was a brilliant idea too when we broadcast from the Midsummer Carnival. There's so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've had such wonderful guests over the years, the 20 mm. years. Um, we had uh, with one of the little, it was like a little uh, dog box, one of the little the, vans we had. Joan f- Kerner was in it. Yes, oh, that's, that's right. That's yeah, the, uh, the very day. first van that we had. Mm. Um, it was essentially a stripped down donut van. Uh, <laughs> if you remember those sorts yes. of little donut vans you'd see at, the st- at uh, carnivals and things? Well, if you imagine that, without all the heating stuff and everything inside, that's what it was. No air conditioning, just some windows to peer in. Uh, we couldn't stand up in it. It was just a <laughs> little bit <laughs> constricted. And, of course, we've got Joan Kerner coming in for an interview. and thinking now Pop, um, Current uh, Premier at the time of yep. Victoria? Yes. Uh, yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. Lovely Can't lady, too, by um, the way. But she was very cooperative and was having a, a good time. Uh, so it all worked and worked well. And, and of course, the, the quality at the time, uh, and John mentioned it before, was that um, it was on a telephone line. Yep. So you didn't have the broadcast quality sound. We had this, this sort of tinny... Oh, it wasn't bad. Fiddle with, yeah, wasn't it wasn't bad. bad. Yeah. I wouldn't say it was Don't talk it down, Ian. Don't talk <laughs> it down. <laughs> um, but it was a humble beginning. And uh, in, in later years, we uh, had a, a broadcast van at one stage that we borrowed. Uh, that came from a consortium of three doubles, uh, three triple Z and uh, somebody else. So we had that van. And then we had some of the larger um, open air vans, I guess you'd call them. Um, they were just sort of a, a, not a caravan as such, but a, uh, a long... Oh, how would you... Van? Yeah. yeah. A box. It's a big a box on wheels. Windows. <laughs> <laughs> now, please join our uh, global conversation by emailing onair at joy.org.au. That's O-N-A-I-R at joy.org.au. Or join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag joywad. We've had some more messages in. Uh, Midsummer. The Midsummer Group have said thank you for being fabulous and entertaining all these years. Uh, the VAC GM- GHMC, congratulations to Joy for 20 years of GLBTI broadcasting. And uh, we had a message in from Danica and April. They're from Melbourne, but they're travelling down to Torquay to soak up the sun today. So they're in the car. They lo- wanted to say that they love Joy. And also, P.S., does Joy reach Torquay? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe depends on the weather. I'm not sure. It would on your iPhone. Would it? Yeah, yeah, iPhone. Yeah, yeah okay. that's right. Yeah. Stream yeah. us live at joy.org.au or today at uh, uh, World AIDS Day worldwide.org. Um, in our last few minutes uh, before the top of the hour, I want to uh, cover off uh, our license application, which eventually led to our full-time license being granted in 2000, at the end of 2001. And we went first, first, first broadcast full-time uh, in January 2002. What was the process to get that uh, license application in? What was the work involved? A lot of paperwork, wasn't there, Ian? Uh, I, yes, I uh, think you were involved uh, a bit more than me. 
with that part. And at the actual license application itself, the final application, I was already out of it by that stage. Oh, okay. um, I'd been ill and uh, separated from the station there for a little bit. But on the lead up to that, I, I guess in the years that preceded that, there was a lot of documentation that we needed to create to, to show and to demonstrate uh, to the authorities that we knew something about what we were doing. Um, things, uh, policies and procedures of, for different things, the way we were handling sponsorship. And all of that information needed to be uh, merged, if you like, uh, and eventually would form part of the submission that would go to the ABA. And letters of support from the community at large. Mm -hmm. And uh, those letters of support, we, we requested them to write in to Joy and send it to us, and we had quite a few thousand of them. So did we did we collect those over a number of years? Yes, we continually yes, asked yes, 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 to help support yeah. the the eventual yeah. application. Yes, it did, and uh, of course we we did have that in the beginning too. We had to have the letters of support. That was the most important thing, and uh, I think that it's uh, the support so side of it showed quite well. We also uh, had uh, the Australian Broadcasting Authority come down and the president and meet us all at the Coventry Street and gave a speech and talked about it all and talked to all the other aspirant stations. We had a special meeting there and they were thrilled that we actually got them all, all the aspirant stations involved to come and have a meeting with the president of the Australian Broadcasting Authority. So we facilitated. Yes, we did. Yeah. Wow. So we mm. were the leaders for the asp other aspirant stations In as well. In a way, yes. yes. Fantastic. We, we, it's probably worth noting that we had a, already established that sort of situation uh, beforehand. Uh, we often um, used our transmission facilities for other community stations. Uh, at times when we couldn't get our, our license, we would per perhaps um, have the Kui station, for example. They would use our transmitting facilities or we'd help uh, some, other, some of the other aspir aspirants. Mm -hmm. um, Kix FM at, at one stage, we helped them out. Uh, again, sharing and establishing ourselves not as a... Um, our own little clique, if you like, uh, or individual group, but a group that was willing to reach out and to share with other um, aspirants, so irrespective of the fact that it was, in a sense, our own competition. Um, you know, we, we wanted to at least demonstrate that. Uh, there are some other things that we did. Uh, the Princess Diana funeral, for example, uh, we broadcast that. Uh, we had to work very quickly to get links established uh, so that we could take a live feed. Uh, that was provided by... Um, Triple R. Triple R, that's right. Uh, and so, you know, that, that whole spirit of cooperation was engendered um, early in the piece and continued onwards and so sort of gave us that, that leading role, if you like. Um, talking of uh, uh, being working in unity, I had another message in from Michelle Barber, who actually stand, uh, presents a, a relatively new show here at Joy called Stand Up Straight. And uh, she says that we are relatively newcomers to Joy, but have never been so embraced so fully. The Joy family is unique and we are honoured to be part of it. I love to walk through those doors and we'll continue to take Joy to the world. That's Amazing good. sentiment. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Michelle. Uh, guys, what, what were the more difficult aspects of the licence application? What were the questions we found it really difficult to answer? I, I, looking back on it, um, it all seemed difficult, but I, in the, la in the actual full-time licence 2002, I was not really involved with it all because um, I had actually had to stand down a bit because of my health. But the, the whole situation was virtually a repeat of what we did in the initial stage. Right. We had to reapply. We had to put... We were up against five or seven other aspirant stations. Ian, about five. I think it was about five. Yeah. So we had to put our case forward and what we did and how we supported the community, how we actually, um, what sort of programs we were putting to air. It wasn't just all music. It wasn't, uh, it was interviews. It was all different aspects of radio and community radio. And ours mainly went to the GLBTI community. And that was one of the things. There was a, a Koori license to obtain. There was a, a youth station to obtain and the religious station. And there was one other. Because we had a, a, a group of 
individuals wanting to be heard, we got the license. They didn't give it to a licenses that were going for just playing music all day and all night. They wanted to have variety of what we were about and the, and also people who didn't have a voice for the community out there. And we certainly had a voice. We wanted a voice and we got it. Fantastic. Ian, did you have a comment on that? Um, I, I, I wondered, I, I read the, um, the document that came back from the Australian Broadcasting Association after the licences were granted and they did note that it was at the time quite difficult for us to quantify uh, who and where our community was. Mm. Did you did you in, um, anticipate that when you were? Well, initially we we were going for the Melbourne in a, Melbourne in a license. In all openness and honesty, I think we should have been able to get the full license because gay and lesbian community and everyone else is just not in Melbourne. I mean, I live at Frankston. John lives at Frankston. You live at... Uh, Broadford. Broadford. <laughs> um, and John lives... Uh, 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 Philip only is the one who lives in Frankston. Are you saying that not all gays and lesbians live within six kilometre radius? That's right. Correct. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> Very true. I even live on Phillip Island. <laughs> <laughs> and, but this was a, a genuine difficulty in, in, in trying to demonstrate that at the time. Yes, it? it was. It was trying to get it through to them. But uh, they granted us the Melbourne licence and we were quite happy to take that on and do our best with it. And I think Joy has more than done its best. It has done absolutely fabulously. And thank you, everybody out there. Absolutely. I agree. One last message. Luke Gallagher says congratulations to all at Joy on the success and quality of this incredible broadcast. Inspiring stuff. And kudos to all. It is almost time for us to wrap up this hour uh, looking at the first nine years of joy. Uh, John, I know that you had something that you wanted to say. Yes, a quote from Elton John. To the end of AIDS, uh, we and more... <laughs> start, start again. Uh, to the end AIDS, we need to uh, be more... Uh, have more, more than a cure. We need to have more compassion. And I agree with Elton on that. And I also like to thank him for doing such a wonderful job at Britain. And also I'd put love in it because that's what joy is all about. Love. Love. Fantastic. Uh, any last words from uh, Ian? No, just uh, congratulations to joy for 20 years of uh, continuous successful broadcasting. Um, it's well deserved. It's well earned. And, uh, Looking forward to the good times ahead. <laughs> uh, you'll keep listening. Indeed. Absolutely. And John Houlihan, um, do you have any favourite crazy shows on Joy now? Um, <laughs> do any of us come up to your standards? No, I don't, <laughs> think, I, I don't think you can legally, actually. <laughs> <laughs> there is one thing I'd like to say, though. Congratulations for Joy to re to reaching 20 years. But congratulations to John's baby, when he turns 21 next year. Absolutely. Mm. So, so we'll be an adult in the, in the old-fashioned sense next year. In the old-fashioned sense, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Guys, uh, I want to thank uh, all of my guests today. Uh, thank you to uh, Mr. John Oliver. Thank you uh, to John Jennings and to Philip Burt, who joined me in the first half of this hour. Thank you to, uh, to John Houlihan and to Ian McGowan, who are here and now and who have helped us explore the early years of Australia's first and still the only full-time gay and lesbian or better said GLBTIQ community radio station. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Coming up at the top of the hour, we'll have our International World AIDS Day News Bulletin and following that, Dan Gardner will bring you the second hour in our theme of Where Are We Now? He and his guests will be exploring the issues surrounding care and support, HIV and ageing. I'm Chris Jameson. Please stay with us as we continue this historic broadcast wherever you are in the world. Good evening, good morning and good afternoon. Thank you.